Welcome to another episode of the Hustle Nation podcast. Today, as always, we've got a real treat. Mr. Joshua Lifrak is in the house. Josh is head coach at Limitless Minds and owner of Lift Up Consulting. Joshua, welcome to the show. Thanks, Chris. Awesome to be here. So glad we could sync up today, man. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, likewise. And as we were talking before the show, it's incredible how many people are in your network that we've had on the podcast lately and how things just continue to grow. And um, what I find interesting is just, you know, mindset is is everywhere. And most of us don't even know it. And then yeah, there's people I, like you who help people like this for a living. Yeah, I think I think it's starting to get to that to that point, right, where, you know, when I first started in the field, you know, 20 plus years ago, uh, I've told the story before, but I literally had to cold call people to get clients, like straight up cold calling people. This is at IMG Academy years ago. And now it's gotten to the point where entire organizations are just hiring mental skills coaches to be working in their in their corporate organizations, not only in the sports world, the sports world, forget about it. Like every team, if they don't have a mental skills coach, it's like a competitive disadvantage to them. Right. And so now, like every team has got one and, you know, now it's starting to spread out into this corporate world. And I think, Chris, I'll be honest with you. I think the accelerator for all that was COVID. I think people recognizing mental health, recognizing how much their own thoughts were affecting them, uh, being able to step back from stuff and kind of just take some time with themselves a little bit. I think it was like, you know, gasoline on the fire for, for the mindset stuff. I think it's always been coming. Uh, but I think this, that, that, particular period, like really accelerated that growth. So I'm curious, I, and I want to get back to your journey and your story here in a little bit, but where does that fit in an organization? So, and I have to admit, imagine if I look at an org chart, is it HR that says, hey, we, we need help. We need not only mental health, because I think it does fall into that category to a certain degree, but then it's also like, you know, player performance in professional sports. Um, you know, and it's obviously also an advantage in sales because if you under understand mindset, that could help you in negotiating sales and understand maybe what the other person on the other end of the table is thinking and feeling. Yeah, I mean, you just ask the question, where where does it fit in? And, yeah. and if you say like it's sales, HR, leadership, the answer is yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, that, that's it. That's it. I mean, again, we'll we'll talk about the Cubs in a minute. But one of the things that happened with the Chicago Cubs when I was there, I was there from um, 2014 to 2019, part of the front office as the director of the mental skills program, right? So think about that word mental skills. It wasn't mental health. It wasn't mental conditioning. It was mental skills. What are the skills that we need to do to train our mindset and how do we train them? And then boom, here we go. What was really interesting was I was, I was brought on to design the program. And so there was no program to say, hey, design this mental skills program. I said, yeah, okay, no problem. It's not only for the players. It's for the executives. It's for the front office. It's for the coaches. It's for the scouts. It's for you know, the coordinators. It's for everybody. And so that's one of the big things is, is, again, answering your question. Yes, it's for everybody. And I think if you have a job where you have to, quote unquote, perform in any way, shape, or form, mental skills the mindset is going to be a factor in it. You look at, we always talked about when I was at IMG Academy, we always talked about the four elements of performance and the four elements of performance are number one, technical, how I throw the ball, how I kick the ball, how I, you know, like my mechanics really, right. How I shoot all those types of things. Tactical, where I set up my defense, where I set up my offense, when I go for this shot, when I do this, when I go cross court, when I hit a backhand, all those, that's your tactics, right? So technical, tactical, typically taken care of by the coaches on the court. Then you have your physical. You're in the gym, how strong you are, how fast you are, how quick you are, what you put in your body, how you fuel, right? That's the physical. And then the last component of performance was the mental. How you think, how you respond, how you um, deal with adversity, how you deal with success. All of that matters. How you prepare yourself mentally to, to, to join in. So all those different aspects technical, tactical, physical, mental, if you really attack all four of those from the training side, your performance is pretty much going to rise. It's not guaranteed, but at least you're controlling all the things you can control to increase your performance. 
So the million dollar question there, you mentioned technical mechanics, tactical, physical, and mental. Mm -hmm. And it probably varies for everyone greatly. What percentage of this equation is mental? Yeah. And so if you're talking about golfers, like you were talking about golf, right? I'm going to let you get to that one. 950%. No, I'm just joking. Um, It really, it really is. I think, I think they play off of each other. It's always interesting when a lot of times back in the day, when I would first meet a group of athletes, I would ask them, Hey, how much of, how much of success do you think is mental? And you know, you would get any from the athletes, they would say anywhere from like 50 to 70 to 90%. Some of them would say, well, and then I would say, well, how often are you training it? And then there'd be crickets, right? And yeah. so it was always really yeah. interesting, right? It was like, oh, okay, and that's, that was the buy-in. It was a little, you know, the hook, right? You talk about marketing, it was the hook. Um, and so I don't know what the percentage is, okay? I really don't. But here's what I do know. The Chicago Cubs won the first World Series in 108 years in the 10th inning of Game 7. So if you don't think the mental aspect of that played a small role, I think you're out of your mind. I don't know how much, it, even if it was 1%, that 1% made it made a difference. And I think it definitely varies on skill level, right? My son, my youngest son is 13. He plays basketball. There are kids that their mental game could be absolutely awful, but their physical, technical, tactical ability is so much better than the other kids. It doesn't matter at this point. But what we do know, especially in pro sports, and you would think about it actually in sales and in marketing and in leadership, talent runs out like there's a point where all the talent is evil is equal then it's then it then it's all about all the talent is equal then it's all about hey who 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 like what what is that next aspect what are the margins where's the areas that i can increase that other people aren't increasing on right i my one of my mentors uh, a guy named trevor moad who um started limitless minds one of my one of the greats Um, And he always used to say, successful people have simply formed the habit of doing things that unsuccessful people do not like to do, right? So successful people have simply formed the habit of doing things that unsuccessful people do not like to do. So they're making it a habit. Unsuccessful people are just avoiding it, right? And think about that. Think about that disparity. And so, and a lot of it is the mental side. It's funny, you know, I've always thought I was a pretty good judge of individuals who had, um, you know, I, I've I said before, I've called it like king of the mental domain or queen of the mental domain is those people who really work on that. You can almost see it when you're watching professional sports, whether it be Pat Mahomes, Tom Brady, Luca. Um, certainly Kobe and Michael, th- they don't get shaken by anything. In fact, in the last dance, you would hear Michael Jordan talk about fabricating his story to tell himself that this guy was talking trash. And he's coming for this guy. He wasn't going to let anything, even the flu, nothing was going to hold him back. Is, is part of that mental conditioning? Is, is part of that mindset? What do you think? So the, the, the answer is that when you in, in, do mental conditioning, what you're doing is you're working on your mindset, right? So we always talk about confidence. And where does confidence come from? Confidence comes from preparation. Well, if you are prepared mentally, that means you've been doing something mentally to prepare yourself. And, you know, that will increase your ability to your outlook, your mindset will all be uplifted by the fact that you're doing the work on the mind and on that tool. So think about it. If you're, let's, let's just use, let's, again, let's use the sport analogy. If, if I'm a golfer and I've been struggling with my drives and now I sit there and I work on my, I go to the range, I work on it, I work on it, I work on it. But in addition, I go home and I close my eyes and I visualize maybe like 50, 60, 70 times hitting that beautiful poof, poof. What am I doing? Well, I'm creating an identity for myself in my own mind that, hey, I hit great drives, right? Not only was I hitting them good on the range, but now I'm seeing myself hitting them over and over and over again. And I'm kind of imprinting that blueprint in my mind to go hit that great drive. So do you know what I mean? Like that's, that's the mental side of it is it's an increase in confidence because you've been working on it. And so, you know, Hey, I'm going to be able to, to handle this. I know I'm getting better at it because I'm seeing myself getting better at it over and over and over again. Yeah. I, I love that. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, I want to go back to the Cubs organization. Um, you worked at IMG before that, but when mm-hmm. they asked you to create essentially a curriculum or a program at that time, 
not much existed that I'm aware of. Um, how, how challenging was that? And how long did it take you to put together a, a program on mental skills? Yeah, it took me 10 years and thousands and thousands of hours at IMG. So I had been doing that. That's all I did at IMG was create program, create program, create program. We had all these different sports. We had tennis, golf, basketball, baseball, American football, lacrosse, track and field, right? Soccer. And so my job every fall was to create a program for 36 weeks to implement with the athletes and the students there. And so, yeah, I had been doing it for 10 years already. So when you asked me, heck, how long did it take me to, to create that? program that that we implemented at the cups it took me 10 years it really did right because that's what i had been doing and so it was kind of like i was ready for it let's put it that way and, and for those of you listening img typically recruits some of the best what high school teenage level athletes in the country or even in probably all over the world too in right the world, there's 80 80 different countries are represented there 80 wow. eight zero insanity yeah so so you're not just working with typical high school students you're working with top-notch blue chip athletes. Um, yeah, absolutely. So as someone who knows, I would say more than the average person about mental skills and mindset, far, far from mastery, talk to us a little bit about what a mental skills program looks like. And it doesn't have to be for professionals or executives necessarily, but what are some of the components of a program like that? Yeah. So I always think, I mean, I think everything kind of always starts with attitude and mindset right? That's, it kind of starts and ends there. It always, it always comes back to it. And so that's like, number one, that's the main area of training. Okay. So how do I get my mindset to a place where it's going to be um, resilient? It's going to be, you know, clear, it's, it's going to be uh, super aware of what's going on, right? And so all those pieces kind of go into mindset. And, and, and that's where it always starts. From there, there's different elements under mindset. I think there's the element of energy management. Like, how do I manage that? How do I manage the ups and the downs? Okay. Uh, then there's the management of focus and concentration. What am I focusing on? Where am I focusing on it? When am I focusing on it? Those types of things, right? So now we're talking about energy and focus. Then there's, you know, then there's tools under all those. You have your visualization, you have your breathing stuff, you have your meditation, all those different pieces kind of lie under that. Uh, in addition, then there's motivational pieces, right? Again, all tying back in the mindset. So how do I motivate myself? What, what am I trying to achieve? Why am I trying to achieve it? What's my purpose? How does this affect others? And then I think always number, number there's one that, that I think kind of most people kind of forget about. That's like coachability and being a great teammate. And so that's another element of the mental side of it, right? If I can be open, if I can listen well, if I can learn faster, if I can work with others, right? No one of us is as good as all of us, right? That kind of a thing. That matters too. That lifts all bolts, even, at, even in individual sports, right? Because you think about like French Open is on right now, right? Think about all those tennis players. They have a whole team. Those, those people aren't out there all alone. They have a coach, they have a nutritionist, they have, a, you know, they have all these people, right? I just ran into um, one of the phys physical conditioning coaches who was on the tour for years. I just ran into him in a cafe here in Sarasota. And he was just like, we were just shooting the breeze about how, what it meant like to be on a team like that and why it was so important to have everybody rowing the boat in the same direction. You know, so yeah, so the, all those pieces kind of go under it, but I think it starts and ends with mindset and then everything is really flowing into that and out of that, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, certainly. I love the coachability one because I, I think that there are a lot of young athletes, especially who forget about that one because there are, and it, sometimes it's, it, it can be with the players in the middle or it can be with the ones that maybe are less skilled or more skilled, but I find that that one gets overlooked a lot. So I, I would agree with that. Where do you find the, the average person, the average working adult, where do you find is the, the most common area where they are deficient or an area where that, that could really get them to that next level? I, I think the number one element of that is, is choice. I think people forget that they have a choice on how to think. They react rather than respond. So, you know, that was one of the big things in my early career that I learned. I was like, oh, wait a second. Like people, people can think in a certain way that's going to help them, right? People can th think in a certain way that's going to hold them back. And, and we actually, regardless of the thoughts that pop into my mind, which are just constantly happening, they're just bang, bang, bang hitting us. 
like I can step back and I can actually have a choice on how I respond to a situation. I have a, I have a choice of what I think going into this situation. Does that mean I'm not going to have negative thoughts ever? Absolutely not. You're going to have negative thoughts all the freaking time. Even Kobe had negative thoughts. He just sure. dealt with them in a different way. And so I think that that's, that's something that a lot of people don't, don't dive into, um, I think, on, on the normal level. And I think going from the sports lane to the corporate side, that's one of the biggest things I'm starting to see is people recognizing that they actually do have a choice on how they think yeah. about a situation. Yeah. I think the one thing that I would say about that, though, is you, you said it. When you positively think, it typically, right? There's no typically. guarantee. There's right. no guarantee there. And, and one of the things that we've seen, and there's been like this pushback about um, kind of toxic positivity and, and things of that nature. And I think, I think that's real because if you're super positive about a hyper negative situation, sometimes what happens is that super positivity leads to inaction. And without action, there are no result changes. There's nothing. So one of the things that, that that's what we do at Limitless Minds, and I think probably Colin talked about it when you had him, but we talk about this thing called the neutral mindset. And what the neutral mindset is, is a thought process that focuses on concrete and objective facts without judging or grading. So it doesn't give it positive or negative. It just says, this is where I am and I got to deal with it. And this is how I'm going to deal with it. It's not about positive and negative. It's just about, hey, here's what's so. I have cancer. Okay. This is your example, Chris, right? I have, I've been diagnosed with cancer. My next steps are I got to go to chemo. I got to do this treatment. I got to take these pills. These are the next things I got to do. Boom. That's it. Right. It's not about like, oh, awesome. I have cancer. Hooray. I always beat stuff. I'm <laughs> uh, no worries. Like, Hey, I I'm all good. Like, no, that's not real. Right. What's real is you're going to have emotion that is yeah. probably going to be pretty negative. Yeah. And so it's not about, not about not having negative. It's about dealing with the negative and getting it into an action oriented situation. I have this really bad diagnosis. Okay. What's my next best step? What's my next right step right now? My next right that. step is to go A, B, and C. The doctor has me prescribed for this. They have me to do this. I have to show up to this. I have to eat this. I have to start thinking about this, right? Maybe it was you thinking about your kids that like motivated you to, to push through this, right? Yeah, it's part and of it. What we, know, what we know, actually, there was a great study that was done, um, and I, I apologize. I, I don't have the citation off the top of my head. But basically, they looked at like a couple hundred thousand studies on well-being. And they looked at, you know, hospitals and people in, in, uh, who were uh, in hospitals. And what they found is that the people in hospitals that recovered the best were not the ones that were optimistic. It was the ones that were not negative. They just simply had to be not negative. They outperformed those that were optimistic and their well-being, you know, increased. So there's that too. And that's kind of why we, we like the neutral mindset. I love that actually, you know, um, Dustin, my, my co-host is not here today says so often people say, Oh, I've, I've got this massive task. I have to clean my entire house <laughs> and like, what's the good next step? Oh, so you just cleaned one room. Well, I maybe don't think about having to clean the whole house. Cause that feels very burdensome. It feels stressful just saying that or thinking that out loud. He's like, no, you just need to clean the next room. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that you mentioned there too, Chris, is I have to. <laughs> Funnily enough, we go back to, let's tie it back to the Cubs again. One of, the, one of the first things that I had to do when I got the job in 2014 was I had to rewrite the mental um, skill section of the Cubs way manual. And if you read Tom Verducci's book about, about our 2016 team, there's some stuff in there about what I wrote. But one of the things that he doesn't cite and that he doesn't put in there is we eliminated four words, all right? And the four words were try, can't, should, and have to. We Actually, it's five words, but whatever phrases. So we eliminated those four things. Um, people weren't allowed to say them in the organization because can't, I mean, that's an obvious one, right? If you say you can't, you're right. And so we're trying to do something we hadn't done in 106 years at that point. So we might as well get rid of that one. Have to, right? That's about like, I have to do something. It's stress. It's burdensome, right? John Gordon always talks about turning your have tos into your get tos. Yeah. Right. And so, and it just changes all of a sudden how you think about stuff. Should is all wrapped up in guilt and like, and it shoulda, woulda, coulda, didn't, you know, all that kind of stuff. And, and it's like also wrapped up in, you know, past versus present. And then try, 
try was rooted in failure. Like it's rooted in excuses. So we just eliminated those words, you know, Yoda, there is no try. There's only do or not do. And so that was like, we eliminated, it was really interesting that, that you brought that up. So, you know, you get, Hey, you get like, honestly, I'll be, this is kind of weird, but did you ever just like blast Led Zeppelin and just start cleaning? It's freaking awesome. It's a lot of fun to do that. Like I haven't done it in years. Right. Just put some great music. I put a great podcast on. Listen to the Chris Burns podcast. Come on, Hustle Nation. Put that on. Start cleaning. 30 minutes later, man, the kitchen's done and it looks great. Who knew? Hey, I mean, it's not Led Zeppelin, but I do that all the time, whether I'm doing yard work or uh, working out. I mean, it, cleaning, that, that's the way to go. You yeah. got to find a way to enjoy it. Um, I like that you said get to because um, I'm going to credit my wife for this, but we were sending our kids. We have uh, twin girls that are nine years old, uh, eight at the time. My, we, we signed them up for a camp, week-long camp. They had never left us other than maybe babysitter for a couple nights here and there. And initially, they were like, huh? We're, go we're, gonna, we're not going to be around mom and dad for a whole week? Yeah. And my wife said, you know, you get to go. It's going to be so exciting. And we changed our language. We changed our tone and how we talked about it. Talked about the opportunities, things you're going to learn, things you're going to do. And it was amazing. Uh, it worked. And it, they, they saw it differently because of the way we talked about it. And uh, I think a lot of it's just that. Sometimes it's just the words that we choose to use and then the ch words we're going to eliminate uh, and not use that can make a difference, not just with yourself, but also it could be parenting, could be work, could be a lot of things. Yeah, it goes back to the mindset that we were talking about earlier, right? Starts and ends there. Hey, I get to do this. Okay, cool. What's going to happen to the motivation? Increase the motivation. Excitement for the opportunity. Um, you know, they're going to respond better to adversity because they're getting to be there versus having to be there. Having to be there, something bad happens, something tough happens, man, they're going to melt down, right? Yeah. So it all kind of, it all circles back around, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to ask you, you talked about the Cubs way. Yep. And outside of some of those things with, you know, elimination of words, what is the Cubs way? Yeah. Well, I think it was, it, honestly, it's a document that's probably about 70 pages. So there's a lot of stuff in there with how we hit, how we do that stuff. But, but ultimately it boiled down to the identity of what we wanted to be as, 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 as an organization. Right. And so I think one of the big things to, to think about as we think about this mental skill stuff and all that is being, doing, and having. So when you decide to be something, you're going to do stuff to honor that being, that identity piece. I'm a hard worker. Okay, you're gonna, you, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to stay later at work. You're going to be more focused when you're engaged with stuff, right? I hustle. Okay, what's that going to look like? That's going to look like, hey, I'm energized uh, when I get the opportunity to sell. If I don't have something on my dock, I'm going to like really work to find something, et cetera, et cetera. Right. You, you talk about this with all your clients, Chris, about how the difference between hustling and burnout and things of that nature. But right. Do. And so there's that being. And, and for us, being cub meant three things. OK, it meant three big things. Number, number one, C. Right. C was courage. And it was the courage to do the right thing and the courage to do the right thing at the right time. Right. Then it was you urgency, the urgency to get it done right here, right now. And then B was belief belief in our organization and our teammates and in ourselves that we were the ones that were going to get it done. So that's really what it boiled down to. And it's very simplest, simplest form. I love that. that. That's great. Now you've had a chance to work with other professional organizations, whether it be as a consultant or as an actual employee. Do you find that, you know, other organizations have, have a way of doing business, have a way of operating? The good ones do. The good ones do. Some of the corporate clients I have right now, their value systems are really, 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 really solid. And as a result, they ha they, they're they very clear about who they are and what they're doing. Um, one client I have is, is a restaurant group, right? So I, I, I worked in the hospitality industry for years um, prior to getting into sports psychology. I, I didn't know about that field back then. So I was 10 years working in restaurants in New York City and, and, and uh, at high, like three, four star levels. Um, and so I had some contacts there. So I've started working with a couple of restaurant groups uh, in New York and in Philadelphia and in the Northeast, basically. So one of the things that's really interesting is one of the groups that I've worked with, their profits and their, um, and their revenue has skyrocketed to record heights. 
that they haven't seen in like they've been around for 25 years and it's the highest profit margin they've ever had. Um, and one of the things, and there's several different restaurants around, it's not just one restaurant, right? So it's a group. And, and one of the things that they talk about is like, we want people to walk into a restaurant that we have in Jersey, as well as a restaurant that we have in downtown Philly. And we want people to feel exactly the same when they come in and come out of there, right? So yeah, right, absolutely, that, that, that matters. Um, and so when you see really good organizations, they're typically gonna have that. Organizations that struggle, man, it's gonna be all over the place. They're not gonna know who they are. They're not gonna have that identity. Um, maybe they're starting to search for it, right? And, and that's a good start. Some don't even try and search for it. They're just about the money and you know they're gonna take that as long as they can take that. Interesting. I want to I want to pivot subjects. We've talked a little bit about, you know, professionals, executives, business. What about helping someone who coaches sports and and more specifically youth sports? I think that mindset is really important and as a father of of children who all play sports and you know, are relatively competitive, you know, I want the best for my kids. I I would love them for them to be competitive. Um however, I want them to be competitive in life as well whatever they choose to do, whatever they want to do. And uh, I, I want them to, and I tell my kids a lot, we talk about, you know, what is hustle? And it's about, we're going to work hard. We're going to give it our all. We're going to outwork the other person. And, you know, we're going to have fun. We're going we're gonna to have a good time doing it. And uh, I, I want them to do that in life too. And so I'm curious, what, when you teach it, by mistake, we can teach mindset the wrong way. So- sure. What are some what's some good framework or some good tips for people listening that can kind of work with some of this stuff with their kids to get them exposed to it? Yeah, so I think one of the big things for me is like what what is the purpose of youth sports? Um, I I mean I, I'm not going to get on the soapbox here box here, but like youth sports, it it pains me sometimes to to watch it because it ends up being a money grab for a lot of these organizations, and it, it's it, it can yeah. be a challenge. Now, here's the thing. Youth sports are so crucial to the development of our, of, of our next generations because it's a really great opportunity for them to get off of their phones, to be around others, to deal with failure, to have to understand how to be a great teammate, to have to struggle, to have to fight, to have to like exert energy, and, and to be held accountable. And so yeah. I think youth sports are, are paramount for 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 growth uh, um uh, of the youth now but i think one of the big things is to recognize why they're doing it and so as a parent if i'm getting caught up with making sure that my kid is on the best teams and that's all i care about that and i want to win 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 at like hey the u12 championship like nobody cares sorry True. I, I, I mean, your parents care, you care, it feels great and all that stuff. But it's not about winning the U-12 championship. It's about all those things that went through it to, to be successful. And that's the whole key. And so, like, I coach my son's basketball teams a lot. And I'll get, I'll catch myself, Chris, I'll have to step back. And I'm like, man, it's not about winning right now. What's the one thing we care about? Are you working hard? Did you run back on defense? Did you know who you were supposed to guard? Right? Did you, yeah. did you, when you made a mistake, did you respond quickly and just get back on defense and get on to the next thing? That's all I care about. If my, if the kids that I'm coaching walk out with that, awesome. Awesome. Sometimes we're going to win. Sometimes yeah. we're going to lose whatever. But the whole key is about that, that work ethic, that response to failure, that ability to understand and concentrate in the moment that matters, right? Cause that's the stuff that plays on in your career. Yeah. Resiliency. You know, and yeah, kids no are very resilient, but, um, you know, I think as I've watched my, all, all of our kids play sports, you know, none of them are, are ever going to be the, the best player in the grid and that's okay. But it is fun to see them develop resiliency to develop their skills and to see how, you know, a lot of those things, just being around competitive sports can help them in school will help them in life. No doubt. Because it's competitive out there. Life can be, life can be tough. And yeah, no I doubt. think having not grown up doing something competitive, I don't care if it's sports or not. I think 
you know, kids can be at a bit of a disadvantage by, by not being involved, but also too, it, it is fun. I mean, it, there is a lot of memories, whether you, you win or lose. I, I think of, you know, the, the times where kids have come back to me years later and say, Hey, thanks. Thanks for coaching. Like it, yeah. it made a huge difference. Even if I don't think their skills developed that much, they certainly enjoyed the process because allegedly I was the coach. And so that, you know, to me, it, it's, it's so rewarding to be a coach not just for the stuff they do on the court and on the field, but for the, the development that they have as little human beings. Yeah. Without a doubt, man. I mean, that's, that's the whole key. That's the whole key. Yeah. Good stuff. Uh, all right. So, so Josh, I want to hear, I'll share some stories with us about your time in professional sports. Do you have a favorite story looking back at your time working in the MLB or for other professional sports organizations? So, I mean, Winning the World Series is pretty freaking cool. <laughs> yeah, now there I may mean, have been some adversity in that one. Let's hear about it. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean that one's that one's like the really obvious one because it was such a joyous experience. And honestly, I kind of blacked out. I'm not gonna lie to you. Like, I just kind of woke up and I was like in a parade. You know, I was just like, what? what? What just happened? Um, so there was a lot going on there. But I think, you know, when you talk about stories and and, and moments in sports, it's always about the moments where for, for me specifically, right. I'm mental, mental skills, right. Working on the mindset stuff. It's when there's that moment that maybe an athlete couldn't get through, hadn't gotten through before. And just by shifting their mindset a little bit or focusing on other things, they're able to move to that, to those next levels. So I think that those are, those are really like the most beautiful times for me. And so there's a ton of them. Um, there's a lot of, lot of times and it might've been the smallest thing. It might be, you know, a, um, a player finally getting called up to the majors, or it might be a player who, you know, never got a hit against this one pitcher. And now all of a sudden he gets a hit, or it might be, you know, that basketball player that's been missing three pointers for a while. Now all of a sudden they've changed it and they've worked on it and bang, all of a sudden they hit five in a game, you know? So there's tons of those all over the place. So I don't really want to single them out. Uh, but I, but I do think, you know, that that's one of the beauties about sports is there's so many small little victories within the scope of the landscape. And, and I think that the normal human being who's not a professional athlete, right? I say normal because we're not professional athletes, but there's so many victories in your day. And we often yeah. miss those left and right because we're so focused on what we're stressed out about. We're so focused on, you know, what we have to do versus what we get to do. We're so focused on, you know, this or that or the other thing that we miss out on those small little victories. And I think that that's one of the big things for me. Um, when I was with the New York Mets, we were in COVID. And so we were remote. We didn't know if we were going to have a season. We were, um, you know, all working from our homes. And I was talking to the HR director and they asked me to present to the entire organization. And the thing that we presented was just win today. Not win the day, not win a day, but win today. And so one of the things that I, that, I, that I think I want to encourage people to do is like really think about winning today. And what does that look like? What are those small little big, did I get outside and go for a walk? Did I hug my kids? Did I get to hug my kids today? Did I, did I um, learn something new, right? What did Jimmy V say in his you know, great speech? You cried, you laughed, you thought, right? Did you do those three things? Did that happen? Yeah, man, I did all those. You win. You freaking win today. And a lot of times we don't give ourselves that credit and we don't give ourselves that little scoreboard of winning. And I think that that, I think more than anything else from sports has taught me, there's an opportunity to win today, no matter what. So just go out there and do that. And when you do that, great things follow. Ooh, that's deep. I love that. We weren't going to go deep today either, Chris. We were going to keep it, do simple better, right? We we're just going to do simple better. I mean, I like that too, but I, you know, occasionally <laughs> when you talk about subjects like this, I, I think it's important to go deep because I don't care who's listening out there from the most successful executive to, you know, the college graduate is trying to make a career to maybe a, a single parent or someone facing some serious adversity, even a, a young athlete. Um, we, we've all been there. We've all been in times where, you know, we weren't sure about the future. We weren't sure we were ever going to be successful. We had imposter syndrome or we just went through a, a major travesty or major loss. And usually what's got me through it is mindset. And it, yeah. it's not that I'm perfect at it. I've, I've said it before, I'm not at mastery level, certainly not Yoda. I'd love to be, but it is 
mindset. It, uh, so many things in life and business success comes back to or starts with mindset. Is that, is that fair? Yep. Yeah. Attitude is everything. I mean, that, that's our tagline at Limitless Minds. Attitude is everything. So yes, yes. My, mindset matters, man. It really does. Um, can you have a negative mindset and be successful? To a degree. Right. I remember there was this Nike commercial back in the day. It was Landon Donovan World Cup. I remember this. And uh, the whole ad campaign was my 100 is better than your 100. Right. And, and I thought that was really interesting. Like if I maximize all of my talents, my skills, my tools and stuff like that, then my ceiling is going to be higher than your ceiling. And so that was that's kind of what we're talking about here. You can go through life and not even think about mindset and you're going to get to a certain point and that's going to be your ceiling. But now you add that mindset piece into it and you focus on training that you focus on, think about what you're thinking, right? And you manage that and you harness that to its ability. Now your ceiling goes up, right? And your potential goes up and your ability to succeed goes up, right? It's not a guarantee, right? Trevor always used to talk about, Trevor Moad always used to talk about training this stuff. All you're doing is buying a bunch of lottery tickets. And I just happen to have more lottery tickets than the guy next to me. Right. So my chances of success are better, not guaranteed though. Yeah. So how many people and you know, have you worked with? And maybe let, let's focus <laughs> on the athlete side of things where they they just push back and push back and they just don't want to do it. They're like either this they don't buy in or they just say it's not for me. Or maybe you tried and it's like whatever their approach was, their mindset was that wasn't gonna allow them to take that next jump. Yeah, that certainly happens, Chris, without a doubt. I mean, you're gonna you're gonna run into athletes that just they they know better right? They're professional athletes. They're the top 0.1% of the population. Okay, fine, right? You can, I'm not going to make them wrong. I think one of the big things that, that, that is, is key for coaches who might be listening to this or, or mental skills people that might be listening to this is meet the athletes where they're at. If that person doesn't want anything to do with mental skills, cool. All good, man. Ask them what they do. Maybe you know, try and figure out what has created success for them in the past to help them. Awesome. Let them roll with it. You know, you're not in their body. So, so we can't ever really know better. They know who they are. Now, can you give tips and hints and stuff like that? Sure. If they're open to it, but you, you can never force anybody to do anything. That's going to be on them. All you can do is provide a vessel to drink from, uh, an opportunity, learning lessons, but knowledge minus action equals nothing, right? So you provide the knowledge, they provide the action. I like that. So Joshua, I want to wrap this up here pretty quick, but I didn't ask you how you got started in all of this. <laughs> Usually my first question is about your journey and we just, yeah, jumped, we just jumped in, Chris. right That's... into the deep end, which I, Bertie, I love. This but... is not atypical for a live rack podcast. I will just, we just jump in because I get excited to talk about this stuff. You know, all. but those are usually the best conversations. <laughs> uh, just kind of take, like I said, I always tell everyone, this is an organic conversation. Wherever it goes is wherever it goes. And trying to script it out because, uh, I think that's where we get the most value. But anyways, according to LinkedIn, it says you started as a mental conditioning consultant at IMG. And then you re re yeah. referenced the, uh, the restaurant industry. How, does, how did you get into all this? Yeah, so my, my path is I was in the restaurant. I, after, after I graduated University of Rhode Island, go Rams, um, I had a degree in sociology. I had no clue what I wanted to do. Zero clue. I just had, his, I, it was like sociology is kind of cool. I like how cultures are formed. I like how things affect other things and how people, how groups of people think and et cetera. Um, and so I studied it and I really liked it, but then it did, I didn't know what to do with that in terms of a potential career. So I was kicking around and I was waiting tables kind of all over the country and then ended up in New York city. Cause I kind of wanted my life to be an adventure versus just a regular old, you know, life. And in Manhattan, you can, it's like you walk in the street, man, and it's an adventure, right? So lived there yeah. for 10 years, was working in that restaurant world. But, you know, after about probably about six or seven, kind of was like, I, I need something different. This is great. This is fun. But, you know, for the long term, um, I, I want to have more impact in the world and I want to do something a little bit more uh, different. And then, you know, so I ended up going back to school to study. Um, you know, sports psychology. That that being said, I had to do about 20 credits of physical education and psychology at Brooklyn College before I could do that. Um, mm. And then I applied to the different grad schools, got into Ithaca College in San Diego State. I am a glutton for punishment. So I chose Ithaca in the winter versus San Diego State um, and had a great experience there. Ithaca's spectacular school. Uh, while there, 
I was watching a show called uh, HBO Sports. On HBO Sports, they were doing a little segment on this academy in, in Bradenton, Florida, called IMG Academy. They were interviewing this young Russian tennis player, and they simply asked her, you know, you're blonde, you're a beautiful person. Um, there's this woman, Anna Kornikova, who's Russian and blonde as well. You know, she's making bajillions of dollars as a model on tennis. But are you the next Anna Kornikova? And she looked dead in the camera and said, nope, I'm going to be the first Maria Sharapova. And I said, I want to learn that mindset. And the next day, I, I, I kid you not, Chris, the next day I walk into um, one of our, our, our sports psych classes. And the professor was like, I got an email last night from a place called IMG Academy. They're looking for interns. Is anybody interested? Talk about serendipity. Yep. Yep. So uh, wow. I was an intern there um, and I had, a, had a great experience as an intern. Went back, wrote my thesis, finished my master's degree and was hired shortly after. And then that started the career. So you believe in serendipity? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Me too. I, I, think, I think serendipity is just being open to the possibilities, right? It just kind of like just, and, and again, it's like being awake. It's just being awake and just being aware and being open, right? And I, yeah. I, I mean, most people who have contacted me on LinkedIn or whatever, I, I, I'm typically a yes first person. Yes. Mm. Okay, wait, wait, what am I signing up for? <laughs> I'm sure I'm, and I, I'm proof of that. <laughs> right. So that's, you know, that's kind of just, and, and I've just found that, you know, if, if things find me, then, then I'll give it a go. We'll see what's going on, you know? And, you know, as uh, serendipity has it, we've uh, recently interviewed and had on the pod uh, a bunch of people in your network. So yeah. Funny how that works. Um, before I let you go, Joshua, tell our audience where they can find you and what else you have going on. Yeah, certainly, as Chris, Chris mentioned, LinkedIn, you know, Joshua Lifrak, L-I-F-R-A-K. That's LinkedIn. And then on uh, Instagram, Joshua Lifrak, right? Those are, my, those are my two accounts. I think, I think I'm on TikTok, but I think I have a total of like 23 followers. So don't even worry about TikTok. I just, I got scared of it. So I just didn't do anything on there. Um, but yeah, those are the two best places. I think if you're interested in Limitless Minds at all, LimitlessMinds.com is a great place to go. There's lots of different resources there. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter there and, and we'll give you great tips and uh, every, every other week, basically, um, that comes out. And so, yeah, there's that, those are the best places to catch me. You know, and then feel free, like seriously, feel free to follow me on LinkedIn or, or Instagram. And then if you have specific questions, just DM me. I got you. You know, we'll, we'll talk it out. Or listen to this podcast again. Yes, there Joshua. you go. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Thank you for being on the show. That was awesome. I love mindset. We love mindset. And I just think it is so much a part of business and success that, you know, we keep coming back to it because it is so important. And, you know, possibly one of the more overlooked aspects of success in business um, by, by many people, not by everybody. Fair? Um, yeah, I think, I, again, and like you said, they're not, not by everybody. But it's definitely a competitive advantage. And those that have already bought into it, they got a leg up. So if you, know, if you want a competitive advantage for, for your own organization, start investing in mindset. It matters. Love that. That's a good way to, to end the show. Thank you for being here. Appreciate you. Folks listening, give him a follow. Check out Limit, Limitless Minds. And if you haven't already, do us a massive favor. Just takes a couple seconds to go to Spotify or iTunes, leave us a review. And we appreciate the ears. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Peace.